Our technique that we're going to be discussing today is a loop and tack tenodesis. When it comes to biceps tenodesis, you have a multitude of options available to you, including topeted groove, mid groove, super pectoral, and sub pectoral. If you look at the SOS outcome data, both in terms of uh, visual analog scale as well as SANE score, the results are pretty comparable no matter where you put it. It's interesting that in the 20% of cases where the OR time was actually documented, the top of the groove techniques have traditionally been taken longer than our sub pec techniques, which may make them, which may be a reflection of how difficult they have been in the past. Who do we do this in? Well, if you're going to start doing this, I think a good transition for you to make a transition to a loop and tack is to start doing this in anyone that requires a tenotomy. Although I will tell you that I do this in laborers as well as young athletes with type 4 slap tears. The rationale for the technique is that if you look at the results of biceps tenotomy, they're overall the results are comparable to any biceps tenodesis you have out there in terms of pain relief. The problem is in about 20% of cases, the biceps will actually not scar in the groove, fall down and cause a cosmetic deformity and potentially fatigue and cramping pain. With our technique, we avoid the cosmetic deformity and cramping seen in simple tenotomy by grasping the biceps intraarticularly and fixing it at the most distally visualized portion of the intraarticular groove, just above the subscapularis tendon and just anterior to the supraspinatus tendon. In essence, what we're doing is we're directing a tenotomized tendon to scar at the top portion of the groove. You cannot talk about any superpectoral technique without addressing the issue of groove pain and groove pathology. A lot of this stems back to some of the earlier articles, including this one by Dr. Warner, that looked at a much higher revision rate, 45% versus 7% with distal tenodesis. I do have to mention that only 11 out of the 126 tenodesis in that series were actually proximal, the remainder being distal. However, it does bring up a good point. How do you address groove pathology if you do not take the biceps out of the groove? You have to remember that most of the proximal traditional techniques that we have out there for proximal tenodesis have been involving some form of burying the, the, uh, the tendon within a tunnel. If you get this right, you will have a great outcome. However, getting the tension right is very difficult with a risk of overtensioning, which if you have groove pathology is an absolute disaster. In addition, if the tendon is frayed or has any sort of damage, you can amputate the tendon, especially if you fix it with a screw. With the loop intact tenodesis, we address groove pain in two ways. The first is that the technique is an onlay technique. There is no bearing of tendon within a tunnel at all. So there is no risk of overtensioning. Secondly, we allow the surgeon the ability to, uh, to dial in their tension. I'm a strong believer in taking the biceps slightly off tension, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. So what I like to do is grab the biceps as close to the superior labrum as possible and fix it at the most distally visualized portion of the groove. However, if you do not believe in that and would like to minimize how much tension you take off the biceps, the only thing you have to do is grab it more distally, and you will minimize how much tension you take off the biceps. The one thing that you cannot do with this technique, however, is you will never over-tension the biceps. Why do I like to take the biceps off tension? Well, if you take the biceps off tension, you essentially will immobilize the biceps within the groove. So let's talk a little bit about groove pathology. If a tendon does not move, the, ten the tendon will scar within the groove. And this renders any groove pathology that you will have irrelevant. I'm going to say that again. It's irrelevant. The tendon is not moving. Case in point, here's an example of a patient of mine, four years out, status post loop intact, tenodesis. She fell. We thought she tore her cuff. This is her MRI. The tendon is completely scarred within the groove with no signal around the tendon. We tested this concept in the lab to see if we could actually immobilize the biceps by taking six cadaveric shoulders, looking at the motion of the biceps with both elbow and shoulder range of motion pre and post tenodesis. With this technique, we take the biceps off tension about 15 millimeters. What we found is that if you look at the biceps motion pre tenodesis, the amount of motion is actually fairly significant with shoulder range of motion. And this motion is essentially flatlined after you do the tenodesis. There is no motion within the groove. From a numerical standpoint, the majority of the motion occurs when the shoulder is taken from full forward flexion to full extension with almost 21 millimeters of motion. Again, that number is essentially flatlined after the tenodesis. As part of the technique, I think it's important to talk about the loop intact knot. This provides us a very secure way of grasping the, the tendon uh, without the need to externalize the tendon. You can do this with a, the new suture tape link using either a penetrator, as is shown in the animation here. 
You can also alternatively do this with the label FastPass after you put the luggage tag around the tendon. We tested this knot in the lab compared to the standard double cinch, which most people are using, and the whip stitch that most people that are externalizing the tendon will use. We found that from the standpoint of failure strength, these are equivalent. However, this is the interesting part. When you look at the mode of failure with the loop intact knot, 75% of the time, the reason the knot fails is because the suture breaks. In these other two stitch configurations, 100% of the time, it's because the suture pulls through the tendon. What does this mean? Well, if you have a normal biceps, it probably does not matter what you do. But if you have a shredded bicep, such as the one I'm showing here, what the loop intact does is it takes the quality of the tissue out of the equation. It makes your limiting reagent the strength of your suture. As part of this technique, I'm going to show the video here. To put into perspective for you, this video was actually done by my fellow about three months into his fellowship after having done about 15 to 20 of these. I did edit this video down, but the overall unedited time for this video was about 8 minutes and 30 seconds. So here's an example of a 37-year-old with a pan labral tear with biceps involvement. After the breeding, we decided to do a loop intact. So we bring in the free end of the suture tape link and create a cinch knot. We are then going to take the free end and feed it back in. Use a penetrator. We like to use the rhino penetrator with teeth to actually grasp the suture, which creates our knot. We then come in with a pair of curved scissors, cut it right at the superior labrum, and place it over the top of the subscap. This can be the only part of the procedure that can be a little bit challenging. This is a blind hole. I like to mark my hole with a nitinol wire, which allows me to put my labral uh, uh, push lock right next to it in the cannula. The versatility of this technique is that while I showed it to you with an intact cuff, you can also incorporate this into either a supraspinatus or a subscapularis tendon. On this video on the right, you will see a supraspinatus tendon in which we're going to incorporate into the anterior medial anchor. On the video on the right, here's a superior one-third subscapularis tear. One trick that I will give you is if you milk the biceps actually out of the joint and then bring it back in, you can bring your subscap from medial and your biceps from lateral and bring them both together into one single anchor. Postoperatively with these patients, we put them in a sling for about a week, allow immediate range of motion of both the shoulder and elbow. Our study has shown that both elbow and shoulder motion after biceps tenodesis results in no motion of the biceps within the groove. Therefore, the bicep does not see stress. This is why I can get away with putting a 2-9 labral push lock to fix when we've talked about putting massive screws in there. Our clinical results were published in OJSM this year. We had 59 patients with a minimum of two-year follow-up. We had significant improvements in both UCLA, ASES, and visual analog scale scores. The key, key here is that we had no incidence of Popeye deformity, no pain in the bicipital groove after two months, and no pain upon palpation of the bicipital groove. We did have one patient that had a massive revision uh, due to a massive recurrent rotator cuff tear. What we did find is that the loop intact tenodesis was exactly where we had left it. So in conclusion, this is a quick, simple arthroscopic technique where you're essentially directing a tenotomized tendon to scar just above the subscapularis tendon. The effectiveness of this technique is that it's an onlay technique. By not bearing a tendon within a tunnel, you cannot overtension the biceps tendon. I would personally recommend that you slightly decrease the tension by grasping the tendon as proximal to the superior labrum as possible and fixing it as distal as possible. By slightly decreasing the tension in the biceps, you immobilize the tendon, which renders any sort of groove pathology irrelevant. The loop intact knot provides you a very secure way of grasping the biceps, even in the case of a shredded biceps. And in our clinical series, we had improved clinical scores with no incidence of Popeye deformity or groove pain. Thank you.